Hello ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me and welcome back to the Music Roundup. This week we're looking at Corpus Christi. It's uh, not a Sunday festival, but it's the Thursday that follows Trinity Sunday, so it's, uh, it's just passed. And there's one particular text that's well suited to this uh, individual festival, and that is the text of the Latin hymn Ave Verum Corpus. And this is such a significant text that it's been set many times by a variety of composers. So for today's video, I'm going to talk about settings of the same text by three different composers who are separated by several centuries. The text begins, Ave Verum Corpus Natum De Maria Virginia, and the translation of the whole thing is, Hail true body, born of the Virgin Mary, having truly suffered, sacrificed on the cross for mankind, from whose pierced side water and blood flowed, be for us a foretaste, in the trial of death. And foretaste, the Latin word is pre gustatum. That's a highly unusual word and it gives us a sense of the whole meaning of both the text and the idea of taking communion, especially in the Catholic and Anglo-Catholic traditions. So the foretaste in the trial of death, this is like taking an idea of what would um, then be experienced in purgatory. Now, the three settings I'm going to talk about are by William Byrd, by Mozart and Elgar, and they actually use slightly different variations of the text. They're all fairly consistent with that first section and then a few of them finish with a blessing, uh, uh, but not all of them. So the first setting is William Byrd, and I've talked about him before in these uh, videos. His Ave Verum Corpus is a very well-known motet. It's not just reserved for Corpus Christi, it's some all the way around the year and we actually did it right back on the first Sunday of September last year. It's a staple of the repertoire, and it's a simple piece for just four voices. It begins like this. as I've said in other videos, was a Catholic who lived through the Tudor period in which the official church of this country changed for each monarch. In the time of Henry VIII and Edward VI, Byrd wrote quite a lot of um, Protestant Church of England music, which is a very different style that had to be in English, it had to be homophonic, so the use of horizontal writing with counterpoint was deemed to make the words unclear and was prohibited in those churches. And then with Mary Tudor, he was back to writing Catholic music. But his actual faith was Roman Catholicism, and so Byrd was uh, writing quite extensively for secret Catholic services. He played a dangerous game in this time, and got away with it mainly because of his significant musical skill. And Elizabeth I, although a Protestant herself, allowed him to write Latin Catholic music, with the loophole that if it was written for her and the royal court, then uh, they were able to understand Latin there because of their education, and so it wasn't a breach of the ethos of the Church of England. That said, lots of Catholic music being written for priest holes in uh, stately homes that remained Catholic in secrecy. Moving on a century, we come to Mozart, and Mozart wrote a lot of choral music early on in his life. He got work writing for churches in Salzburg when he was uh, uh, around 18 or so, and he wrote some of his short mass settings, a few of which we've done at St Saviour's. Which makes it then unusual that his setting of Ave Verum Corpus was actually written at the very end of his life. So when he was a highly esteemed composer, being paid more than some of the highest ranking members of the Austrian army, although he was also a prolific gambler, so he lost most of that money. Although he was very rich, money went straight through his hands and he actually lived, in some cases, in a, in a, in a state of poverty through his own fault. Around six months before his death in 1791, he wrote a setting of the Ave Verum Corpus for this feast, Corpus Christi, June the 23rd, 1791, for a church in Lower Austria, in Baden. And his setting is shorter 
than the other two that I'm going to talk about, partly because it omits any words at the end of the piece. Uh, that is to say, after the words that I read out at the beginning, he doesn't have any sort of blessing. And Mozart's setting is for simple strings, organ and four-part choir. that is uh, the note that it calls to fall down to, that to resolve onto, is already there in the bass. Um. This sort of thing. Um. You hear that this note wants to go down to this C sharp, but it's already there lower in the chord. sense of almost sort of pain and longing that's fitting with the words. Then finally there's a setting by Elgar which is rather plainer actually. I've got a copy of it over, open right here. It starts with the chord and then now the difference with this is that it's set monosyllabically, if that makes sense. So there's no melisma, which is when you sing one syllable over several notes in a row and slur it. This is simply ave verum corpus natum, one syllable for each note. And one of the reasons, because uh, it, it might sound slightly awkward to you, in fact, that, that setting of the text, but the reason for that is, is that the music wasn't originally written for those words. It was in fact a Pia Jesu that Elgar wrote in 1887, in memory of a solicitor who he worked for. Um, he was an intern for the solicitor when he was about 15, and at the death of that solicitor he wrote a Pia Jesu for that man's funeral. Later on, when he was a bit of a grander composer in 1902, uh, when he became better known for his big oratorios and indeed for music for coronations and royal occasions, he bigged up this piece turned it into an Ave Verum corpus by inserting the words in a way that you might find a little bit uh, sort of hammed together, and he orchestrated it as well. But because it was originally written for a solo voice with just organ, you can actually hear that in the character of the music, that in this version it begins with a solo, so very little adaptation made, and then when the choir comes in, the lower voices really are just accompanying and sort of singing out the harmony of the original accompaniment part. So not very much has been done to elaborate the original character of the piece that it was before. Nevertheless, it's a fine setting and it ends with a blessing. O Clemens, O Pie, O Dulcis Jesu Fili Maria. So, O Blessed Jesus, Sweet Jesus, Son of Mary. Um, ever so slightly different words from Bird's setting. He wrote, writes O Clemens instead of O Dulcis. Other than that, it's, um, in fact, I think it's just the words swapped around a bit, the adjectives. No idea why that happened. It could be a simple mistake. Uh, doesn't make too much difference to the meaning of anything. And what's amazing in this setting is that while it's so simple throughout it, <laughs> this blessing. So we've ended the main section in G major, and then he goes to this exotic chord for O Clemens. The distant B major. And the question is, how is he going to get back to where we started? Now well, now we're back. But this, that gives a full sense of security because there's suddenly this chord. Six 
sixth chord, it's an exotic chord in music, that's a French sixth to be absolutely precise. And it actually brings us back home. So Elgoa. There's a chance actually, I haven't looked into this uh, closely enough, but I wonder whether that, that ending section was written when he adapted the piece for the new words, so not part of the original. I think there's a decent chance that that might be true. Um, but it's a colourful and beautiful English setting, Elgar, Catholic composer as well, uh, which was probably still reasonably unusual in his time, even though it wasn't outlawed anymore. Um, and I think it's a very expressive setting of the same text. So three settings of Ave Verum Corpus, more or less the same text for each one, and I hope that you enjoy exploring each one, comparing the different interpretations of the text by these musical figures and seeing what you make of it. Otherwise, thank you very much for tuning in and for listening um, and wishing you a very wonderful patronal festival, members of St Saviour's Church, and do write in, let me know what you think, and I'll see you next time. So thank you very much.